Hello everyone, welcome to 901 Woodworking and welcome to part two of our three-part series on how to build a wine barrel Adirondack chair. If you remember from part one, we built this frame, we made all of the brackets, and we got all the construction on the basic frame finished. In part two, we'll make the back, we'll get all the seat slats cut, we'll finish all the construction, and we'll get everything ready for finish. So, let's get started. The first step in making the back is to choose the staves that you want to use. You need seven of them, and I like to use the stave with the fill hole in it as the middle one in the back, and then use progressively thinner staves as we move out, outward to the edges. The other thing you need are three staves, one as a thin one to act as a support at the top of the back, another one that's maybe two and a half or so two, two and a half inches wide, that will become the support for the arms. And then a third one, another one about two and a half, maybe three inches wide, to provide the support at the bottom where the back meets the frame of the chair. I have on my bench here a block of wood that's been clamped to the bench, and I have a line drawn on the bench here which is perpendicular to that block and that allows me to align the pieces perpendicular to each other and make sure that the back is nice and straight and that the the staves at the top all end at the same height. Once you've chosen the staves and decided on the appropriate arrangement you need to cut the support pieces to length and the first thing we do with that is we mark them on our marking gauge so we know where to cut. Take the three support pieces to your marking gauge and on all of them you'll need to mark the center. The narrow one needs to be 20 inches wide, so we'll put a mark there at the 20 inch point on both ends. And that's ready to cut. On the two other supports, again we'll mark the center. <clears throat> and we'll mark each one at the 20 inch width, but we'll also mark at 26 because these two need to be 26 inches wide. That way, when they're attached to the staves for the back, they will each stick out three inches on each side. With all three pieces marked, we'll take them over to the chop saw and cut. With the crossbars cut to length, take them back to the bench, put the short one across the top of the stave, about two inches or so from the top. The exact dimension doesn't matter, it's whatever looks good to you. Do the same for the bottom stave and center each in the width of the main vertical stave using the center line that you put in. Check to see what size screw fits the best and then pre-drill a hole for the screw. In this case, a one and three quarter inch screw was the right size for me. Check to make sure that the two staves are still perpendicular with each other. This is strictly a visual check since all the edges are curved. It's not possible to use a square to do this. So just do it visually. And then drill a second hole about an inch and a half or so below the first for a second screw to prevent rotation of the two pieces. Pre-drill a hole in the middle of the short upper support stave and then use that to align and pre-drill a hole in the main stave.
Install the two outer pieces next on both the left and the right side. Align it with the 20 inch mark that you put onto the long staves and the edge of the shorter upper stave. Again, install them with one and three quarter inch screws or whichever length fits the best for your particular application. Take the other two pieces that fit in the gap on one side and just lay them in place. Manually center them and place them so that the gap is even between all of the different pieces. Once you're satisfied with the spacing is even, install a single screw into each stave to hold it in place. Then do the same for the other side. Flip the piece over and do the same thing on the short upper support stave. Manually setting the spacing between all the staves evenly and installing a single screw to hold the pieces in place. The last step on the back is to install the arm support piece. The top edge of this piece should be about 10 and a half inches from the bottom edge of the lower support stave. This will give a very comfortable height for the armrest. When I install this piece, I only put screws into the outer two staves and then one in one of the off-center staves. This makes reassembly later easier. And there is the finished seat back. The next step is to prepare the armrests. And this will depend on what you choose to do with your armrests, whether you have nothing on them at all, or whether you have a wine glass holder or a cup holder. The wine glass holder uses a hole that is two inches in diameter, so the stave must be at least two and a half or three inches wide at the front. The cup holder is three inches in diameter, so the stave must be at least three and a half inches or so wide at the front for that particular uh, feature. For this chair that I'm making, I'm going to have a wine glass holder on one side and a cup holder on the other side, so I'll make one of each. For the wine glass holder, I put a mark two inches from the end, centered on the width of the stave. I'll take this over to the drill press and drill a two inch hole. After the hole has been cut and sanded, clamp it in a vise and cut about a half inch wide or so slot in the end for the wine glass stem to rest. Next, drill a 21 64 inch hole 7 inches from the end of the stave. This will be for the attachment to the front leg. For the staves that get a cup holder, the process is a little different. We need to machine a three inch circular depression into the end of the arm for a cup to sit on. This gives a nice flat surface for, to hold the cup and also make sure the cup can't slip off. And we do this with a router and with a jig. This jig is designed to clamp the stave in place and has a three inch diameter hole for a bearing guided router bit to create the depression that we need.
And like we did on the other armrest, drill a 21 64th inch hole 7 inches from the end. But on this stave, we will also drill a hole 21 and 7 8 inch from the end of the stave. This will be for the attachment to the seat back. Loosely assemble the brackets to the bottom of the left stave and then assemble that to the chair. Use the bracket as a guide then drill a 21 64th inch hole through the top of the front leg. Next, assemble the seat back to the chair and use clamps along the two rear legs and the bracket on the left armrest to hold it in place. Use the bracket as guide to drill holes for attachments to the armrest and to the rear legs. Turn the chair around and do the same thing for the right side armrest. The installation of the right armrest is slightly different than the left one in that we never drilled a hole at 29 7 8 inches in this stave like we did on the left armrest. The reason for this is that we can now mark the position of this hole using the bracket and any twist that might exist in the chair can be taken up by the position of that hole. At this point all the other nuts in the chair can be tightened. The last bit of cutting that we have to do for the Adirondack chair is to cut six staves for the seat area. I've picked out six staves here, which I think will work nicely. Each of these staves needs to be 26 inches in width. So we'll go back to our marking gauge and we will mark 26 inches on all six of them and then cut them to length on the chop saw. Okay, the seat slats have been cut. That's the last piece of cutting that we need to do for the Adirondack chair. The last step in the building process is to completely disassemble the chair so that each of the pieces can be individually sanded and finished. I do it this way because that way all of the interfaces between the pieces have finish on them as well. All of these bits in between the parts, if we don't take the chair apart, then those areas do not get finished, but water will most certainly get in there and start the rotting process on this wood. The important thing to remember is make sure all of your brackets are numbered. They are individually sized for and shaped for those joints, so they have to go back in the exact same spot. So I use a Sharpie to number each of these, and I remember the sequence of the numbers, so I know to make sure to put the brackets right back to where they came from.
Okay, with the disassembly of the chair completed, we are now ready for sanding and finishing. That's it for part two. In part three, we'll do that sanding, we'll do the finishing, and we'll put the chair back together and do all the final assembly. There's a few more holes that will need to be drilled and we'll do that during the final assembly. But the way we've left it right now, the holes will help to orient the pieces nicely when it comes time to put them back together so we know everything goes back together the exact same way it came apart. Thank you for watching and I hope you'll join me next time as we complete the build of this wine barrel Adirondack chair.